As much as I got paid, I will pay. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so apparently, it's the, uh, the self-organization for tomorrow worked uh, very well. And uh, the schedule is that uh, there is going to be another lecture by Fernand Kraut from 3 to 4.30. Then the coffee break will be shifted from 4.30 to 5. And then 5 to 6, Marco Zinidarich is going to give another uh, extra hour lecture. OK? This is self-organized, as I said. So it's not, um, yeah, you, can, you can follow it or not. OK, but uh, for now, let me, uh, let me uh, leave uh, Chris Laumann to his next two hours of lectures. Okay. And the server is up. Now is it on? Yes, good. Um, you guys are gluttons for punishment, organizing extra lectures, and you came back for this second Python extravaganza. So, um, okay, I didn't know there were so many masochists in physics. Um, so, I wanted to, there were various issues with the rather um, flaky server. Um, so there are two ways for you to follow today's uh, lecture. Um, if you have, as some of you do, Jupyter uh, already set up on your computer locally, then the notebook is available for download. If you go to the uh, ICTP uh, website for the school and go to the program link and then scroll down to, uh, not that one, Thursday, this set of slides for this four o'clock section, you click there, this is the actual IPython file, so if you wanna run it locally rather than dealing with the server, please go ahead and download it. If you already know how to use Jupyter because you have it locally, you can probably figure out how to do that uh, and just run it on your own machine. Um, alternatively, uh, you can do like we did yesterday and go to https colon slash slash jupyter.ictp.it, uh, log in, uh, and hopefully it'll log in. And then go to examples and click on use for intro to 2018 ictp.ipynb. Everybody there? Everybody who plans to do it? Anybody who's actually gonna follow along at home, you know, are, are you uh, still waiting to get to the examples page to load it? Okay, um, I'll assume that's good. I've already got it open here. Um, so today's lecture uh, is uh, continuing where we left off yesterday, but now we're gonna actually dive into um, the numerical array functionality in NumPy and some uh, sparse array functionality in SciPy. Um, and by the end of the lecture, so we're gonna start with basic things, uh, using those libraries, using arrays, slicing, et cetera. By the end of the lecture, we'll do some uh, diagonalization of transverse field Ising models because that's what we're all here to do, uh, clearly, um, uh, in this notebook. So the first thing you have to do to uh, use the numerical libraries, scientific libraries, and plotting tools particularly is um, execute this command uh, percent pi lab notebook. Oh, I'm running this locally. I forgot I turned on a thing which tells me how long uh, stuff takes to execute. So on my machine, that took 540 milliseconds. Uh, it won't say that on your copies of Jupyter. But if you want to learn how to do that, come ask me after class. So anyway, um, uh, this is how you Okay, so let's break this down actually. It seems like a simple command, but it's two things. The percent is actually a command we are telling Jupyter, not a command we're telling the Python kernel. It's called a magic, a Jupyter magic or IPython magic command. And what this does is actually sets up the Jupyter interface to be able to deal with interactive plotting. That's the main reason you have to tell Jupyter you're loading these libraries. Um, what it also does is imports a large number of the basic numerical functions directly into the namespace so that we can type array and get the array function. Um, 
that's considered bad practice in bigger programming projects, but for interactive stuff, it just saves a lot of typing. So that's what we're gonna do. And then this notebook here is actually telling the plotting tools that we wanna use a notebook to do the uh, back end for how we plot. Um, and there's a couple of options for how to do that. If you're running it locally, sometimes there's other ones that you can use, but when we're running through the browser like this, this is the best way to do it. So those are what magic commands are. Um, this command here uh, is, uh, actually sets up roughly the same stuff, except for it doesn't load all of the um, sine, cosine, array, math functions, et cetera, directly into your namespace that you can type. Um, and so this is sort of considered better practice by people who like forcing everybody else to type more. Um, there's some reasons for that. Uh, okay, so that's it. So what is the main uh, workhorse in numerical computing with Python, uh, scientific uh, computing with Python, uh, is a type or, uh, called a NumPy array. Um, so arrays in NumPy are multidimensional. They can be vectors, they can be rectangular, they can be three tensors, four tensors, five tensors. You can make as big a tensor with as many indices as you want um, out of it. So, uh, so long as it's, uh, each index runs over um, some number, finite number of values. So they're multidimensional arrays. Every entry in the array has to be the same type. It has to be an integer or it has to be a floating point. That's what makes them different from the uh, lists that we learned about yesterday. Um, the type of an array is a, what's called a D-type, um, and that is a more refined typing system. That means that you say, I want an integer, we'll get into this in more detail in a little bit, of size four bytes, rather than just an arbitrary integer. You have to specify that when you're working numerically because the system needs to know how many bytes to allocate to do the computations. Um, and the arrays, they're efficient maps from uh, indices to values, they have minimal memory overhead. Uh, arrays are mutable. Their contents can be changed after they are created, but their size and the type of object they contain, you can't easily change, so you have to create a new array if you wanna do something like that. Um, so what are arrays good for, sort of at a high level? Uh, representing matrices and vectors, so doing linear algebra. Storing grids of numbers, so plotting numerical analysis. Storing data series, so data analysis. Um, I just put here getting changing slices because it's such a useful actual task, although that's not as high level. That's pulling out regular subarrays. Um, arrays are not good for things where you want to change during the course of the run of a program the size of the array. Then probably you should use a different data structure. Um, heterogeneous objects or non-rectangular data. So if your data would be a bunch of zeros somewhere, maybe the array is not the best choice. Um, okay, so. The practical part, I'm going to uh, get rid of the menu bar on mine so we can see a little bit better. Um, okay, so um, this creates an array. We actually already did this yesterday. So this creates an array, one of, uh, which is a vector, length uh, three, which we can discover by using, yeah? Right, so, uh, good. So if we had not used percent PyLab notebook and we had used this other way of loading NumPy, then we could refer to the array constructor function by explicitly writing np.array, and we can still do that. There's an array. Um, but because we used uh, the PyLab up there, this imported array into the global namespace so we don't have to specify numpy dot or np dot, okay? And what I was saying is that that's considered, you know, bad practice because you actually, this percent pylab command is importing a lot of functions, sine, cosine, array, rand, a bunch of basic sort of numerical functions into the global namespace and they might get in the way. And so people who are purists want you to always type np dot and then whatever function is in that library. And there's some merit to that argument when you're doing something complicated, but when you're just sort of doing quick work, it's often easier not to have to type it all the time. So does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, so np dot array 
and array, now that we've imported them, are references to the exact same function. So it's just two different ways to call the exact same thing. Okay? So uh, arrays have various um, properties. So the shape, uh, in this case, is a tuple. The shape is always a tuple. It's a length one tuple whose zeroth entry is three, which is just telling you that it's a length three vector. Um, it has a, a D type, that was the data type that I mentioned earlier. This is a float 64, which means it's a 64-bit float, floating point number. It has a size, that is um, just the number of entries in the array. So if it was a multi-dimensional array, it would be the product of the values in the shape. Um, a three by three array would have a size of nine. We access the elements using square brackets, just like for a list. So there's one over root two uh, from the zeroth element. And we can change <coughs> uh, entries in an array in place, no problem. We just assign to them. So we just squared the zeroth element of the array. And now we see that it is uh, uh, square root of two. Okay. So far, so good. Uh, we can create a 2D array uh, by passing the array function a list of lists. We met those yesterday, but they have to be all the same uh, size and shape. So here, this is going to be a 3 by 3 array, which looks just like what I wrote, but it's stored internally now in this array data structure, 100001010. Yeah? Ah. So um, all of the numbers in Python and NumPy and SciPy, essentially, are stored internally just in a floating point representation, which means as, well, in binary, but as a, a number with a decimal expansion up to some finite length. There's no exact representation. So there are um, some libraries for Python. Uh, one is called SymPy, um, which allow you to do more symbolic manipulation and would be able to represent an object like radical two. Um, I don't use them. Um, some people do. I think as soon as you want to do things which involve exact like exact uh, representations like that, you, you know, uh, Mathematica and Magma are probably better tools. Um, but some people like SymPy. Is there anybody here who uses SymPy or Octave? Yeah, did you hear that? So he went, it's not great, right? And I think that's basically accurate. So numerical things, Python's great. Data analysis, anything where you're not worried about getting exactly square root of two. But you know, there is an entire uh, tradition of sneaking around this by if you happen to know that your exact representations are going to be algebraic and only a few special square roots will show up, you can often take a floating point and find the closest a plus b root 5 to that floating point number and get a and b, back them back out. Um, there's tricks to do that efficiently, actually. So then you can do the computation quickly floating point and figure out what your exact answer would have been by cheating. Um, so, okay. Uh, and you should cheat. So here is um, uh, the shape of B. It's three by three. So it's a, a length two tuple, three, three. Uh, here is the data type. Well, here I passed in a bunch of integers. And so I didn't explicitly tell the array constructor what data type I wanted it to use. It looked through the list, saw that they were all integers, and decided, oh, you want to use an integer. And so it gave me the default integer data type, which is int 64. That means a 64-bit integer or an uh, eight-byte integer. Um, the size, nine, because there's nine entries in it. And the top left corner is a one. Okay? So now, uh, here is an exercise. Change the last row of B to have a two instead of a one in the middle position. Go! Do, 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 do. Has somebody done it? How do I do it? 
B, 2, 1 equals 2. All right, and let's see if I'm right. Hey, that looks pretty good. OK, very good. Now, uh, here is a warning. There is a type called matrix instead of array in NumPy. This is specially for two index like square or rectangular arrays, but it is not to be used anymore. OK? Uh, it's being removed from NumPy at some point in the not distant future because essentially all it does is produce bugs because it looks almost like an array, but the semantics are slightly different. And if you think you're getting an array and you call matrix multiply and then it like does things transposed or something and then your code explodes and your computer like turns into a puddle on the ground, right? So just don't use it. Don't confuse yourself. If you see a matrix, uh, turn it into an array, which you can do by just calling to array on it. Don't use matrix um, type, okay? Um, <coughs> good. Basic linear algebra. So, uh, what's the most basic thing you can do with vectors and matrices? Well, you can multiply them. Um, or if you're very fancy and you're really into matrix product operators and tensor, yeah? Oh, 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 yes. Yeah, oh, good, good, good. So I think what you're saying is that if I did uh, this, if I said, uh, let me call it a lol, uh, is one, two, three, four, like that, and I looked at my lol, it would be a list of lists, right? So the lol, Oops, okay, the lol, I accidentally hit the key to turn on uh, uh, line numbering. Um, the lol is not an array, it's actually a list which has lists in the items. So if I wanna get the bottom right corner, if I wanted to think of it as an array, I have to pull out that list, and then I can, from that list, pull out the bottom right corner. But the array data type is actually to be thought of as a full rectangular thing, and then it allows indexing where you just put uh, a comma to tell you where you want to look. Whereas here, the list, the list doesn't know that necessarily the item in entry one is actually another list which it could then index into. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the array is different than a list of lists, even though we construct them the simplest way to construct them is by passing a list of lists to the array. Yeah? Okay. Um, excellent. Um, good. Any questions? Yeah. Ah, so say we wanted to convert an array of integers into an array of doubles. We can do that in a couple ways. So first of all, we're gonna to have to create a new array. We don't do it in place. Um, so if I have that array of integers, let's see, was that B? There's an array of integers, right? So one thing I could do is I could do C is just one dot times B because what I just did was uh, use a floating point number multiplication, the integers became floating point, and then it created the right kind of array. So that's a short way to do it. Another more explicit way to do it would be to say C is an array B, and I ex explicitly tell you the D type. So if I wanted it to be float, I could say float 64, and now that's the same thing, okay? Um, and that's what you would need to do if you wanted to use a non-standard number of bytes per entry in the array. Like if you didn't, float 64 is the default, that's a double float. If you wanted to use 32 or something, you'd have to be explicit. Okay, any other questions about constructing? We'll get to other constructors and things like that in a bit, so. And D-types in a bit more detail as well. <coughs> so 
So there are two kinds of uh, basic multiplication. Um, uh, Element-wise multiplication and dot products or contraction of indices, right? If you want to do MPO or tensor network stuff, you might even have uh, things which have three or four indices and you need to do all kinds of uh, contractions on it. And all of those are possible, but the basic kinds are going to be just multiplication. So if we have two vectors, uh, which we've just created, so uh, the first one is 1, 1 over root 2, the second one is 1 minus 1 over root 2, uh, which, for those of you who want to have the geometric representation of the vectors, looks like this, right? So the dot product is what? Yes. Very good. If you multiply my arms together, you get nothing at all. So uh, what does this do? A times A? This is element-wise multiplication. So it's going to give me a vector, which all it did was uh, multiply the first element of A by the first element of A, the second element of A by the second element of A. Okay. The special notation A at A. Here, I'll make it very clear, at, like that. That is the multiplication operator for dot product. And to within floating point rounding errors, uh, you see that 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2 is a normalized vector because its dot product with itself is about 1. Okay. There's also, we can compare, uh, the norm of A, which is just a function which computes the norm of the vector, the standard dot product. Um, and if you look at this, <coughs> these don't agree. So why is that? Yeah, the next, uh, next box kind of gives it away. The norm, of course, is the square root of the dot product. And now, I hope, ah, it does. It actually agrees, right? So. Uh, those are all one for practical purposes. So now what does A star B do? Element-wise multiplication, a half minus a half, and A at B, zero. Right? Orthogonal vectors uh, have inner product zero. Um, there are many, many more functions for doing linear algebra operations numerically. Uh, we'll use some of them as we go, so I'm not going to try to just front load it all. Um, so the first use you can think of of NumPy arrays is as things to do linear algebra, matrices and vectors, kinds of stuff. Um, the second thing, uh, primary use of NumPy is to uh, arrays is to hold grids of numbers, which I don't necessarily think of as being a vector. They are, for example, the values of a function uh, on a grid of points. And that's how I can then plot a function, right? So uh, here, <clears throat> we're going to plot a sine wave. And maybe I'll just execute it. And then we'll go back and figure out what this code does. Uh, ba ba. It's a sine wave. Um, so we are using the notebook mode, that notebook backend. This is an actually. Maybe before I explain the code, I'll just show you that with those few lines of code, we got this nice plot. It was labeled. And in fact, it's even interactive. I can click here, and I can move this around inside my notebook. Um, I can zoom, uh, I thought I could zoom. Oh, there it went. It just took a second, right? Um, and so I can, I can interactively manipulate a little bit. When you are done using interactive mode on a figure, uh, you can click this button, and it will disconnect the interaction between the kernel and the front end. And then you won't be able to change it anymore, but it just it, uh, gets rid of some overhead that the kernel is dealing with. It doesn't really matter if you only have a couple figures in your notebook, but if you have lots of them, you'll end up wanting to do that. Um, OK, so let's go back here. Uh, what is this doing? So <clears throat> this first line is creating a equally spaced array of 100 numbers from minus 2 pi to 2 pi uh, and assigning it uh, to the variable x. So we can take a look 
at x. And that is just an array, a uh, one-dimensional array with 100 entries in it. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. This might take a while. Okay, it has 100 entries. Look, it's clearly divisible by five because it's printed so nicely, so it must be 100. So then, that's minus 2 pi, that's 2 pi, and these are equally spaced in between. Okay, so Lin space created that nice regular grid for us. Then, this line here, y, equals 0 0.5 times sine x. Well, what did that do? So this sine called on an array, it's not, even if it was a two-dimensional array, the matrix function valued sine, okay? We are not doing the sine map on matrices. We are doing the element-wise sine, okay? And it's actually interesting. It's probably only sort of physicists above a certain pay grade who would even think that might be what it meant, <laughs> okay? But that is not what it means, and don't get confused. There are ways to do exponentials of matrices, but the default things won't do that. Um, so here is uh, the sine element-wise of x. So this sine of x is, a is an array of length 100 with each value of the sine in here. And then that multiplication is element-wise. And that's why the star, by default, is element-wise multiplication, because this is actually the most common way you would use it. Doing the dot product is more specialized than just writing functions that you're going to plot. Right? So why is 0.5 times sine x uh, creates an array of 100 things, which are the values of that. And then this code here is our first use of matplotlib. So figure creates a new figure. Plot x, y with two vectors of the same length, or arrays of the same length, plots all the points. This grid command just turned on this very pretty grid in the background. There it is. And then the x label and y label uh, gave us the x and y labels, unsurprising. Let me remind you, this r and then a quote was introducing a raw string. And the reason I did that, and then I put dollars here, is because matplotlib knows to interpret this as a LaTeX math expression then. And you will see over here, 0 0.5 sine x, because there's a backslash sign there, that sign is actually in the font that's appropriate for a function name in math mode. The x is italicized as a variable should be, just like LaTeX would do. Yeah? Hor horrible font. Sorry, say it again. Yeah, they look bad in your notebook? Yes. Yeah. How do you do that? OK, so uh, <coughs> there's actually, I probably, because I'm running it locally, is why it looks different. There is a configuration option for matplotlib, which I just have on, which tells it to always use tech rendering. Uh, yeah, let's see if I remember how to do that. So uh, mpl.rc, um, rc params, text.use tech, I think. Oops, wrong brackets. So rc params. True. So, okay, this is Arcana, but of course, how would you figure out how to do this if this is what you wanted to do and you couldn't remember my Arcana? Is you would Google, how do I turn on LaTeX in you know, matplotlib? And you would find something that explained it very nicely for you, okay? So, uh, RC param, MPL is the matplotlib library. It's how I imported it up above. RC params is basically how you configure it, all these kind of global options, and text.useTech is the global option we want to set. I have it set in a configuration file. I won't tell you in, in this lecture how to do that somewhere, so that every time it loads, it automatically turns this on. But if I wanted to turn it on or off, I could uh, set that equal to true or false, and let's see if it makes this uglier. Yeah, see, it's uglier. Do you guys see? Ugly, right, ugly not beautiful LaTeX. And then we can go back here and go and turn it back on. True. And beautiful, right? It's so easy. 
just one shift enter and suddenly from ugly to beautiful and back again? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. No, so you mean that it looks a lot like MATLAB plotting does? Yes. So percent pylab is what imported those commands that look like matplot, uh, MATLAB plotting. So if you guys know MATLAB, I, I haven't referred to it because it's like the Death Star in my view. But anyway, if you guys know MATLAB, then you'll see that the plotting functionality, like the plotting commands, look very similar. And that's actually what percent pylab imports. It imports a bunch of plotting commands that look like the matplotlib, uh, sorry, the MATLAB ones. There's another way to interact with the plotting library when you're doing more sophisticated things if you get into it, which looks a little less like this. But this is actually, you know, it's intentional. It's so that people can convert from using MATLAB more easily. Um, any questions about that? I stopped giving specification. Right. Oh, ah, yes. OK, so now we're getting into the nitty gritty of how does this know what figure I'm acting on. So in uh, PyLab, which is the MATLAB lookalike plotting system, it's stateful. It knows there's a global variable which contains what is the current figure and what are the current axes. And if you don't, you can, in all these commands, there's a way to actually specify those explicitly if you're doing it more explicitly. But if you have these plot grid x label y label commands without specifying it, they just act on whatever the current global figure is. So in fact, let's see if this works. Uh, right now this figure is live. I can even go down here to another cell if I'm Maybe. What is going on? OK, that got my focus there. And then, no, I'm not allowed to have my focus back. Um, so uh, I could, for example, change the x label to um, the square root of x squared. And if I go back up here, it's still live on this plot because the current figure is still this one because I haven't created another figure yet. If you want to work with multiple figures with multiple subpanels, then you'll start actually referring to them. You can get the current figure, get the current axes, assign it to a variable, and then say, I want the grid to be turned on on that variable, or on that axis. Um, but for simple plots, you don't need to do that, and that's why it contains this little bit of global state, so you don't have to keep track of it. Um, once I disconnect this, uh, I can execute this command, but it, it won't live update in the notebook anymore. It would in some other backends, but in the notebook, once it's disconnected, it's disconnected. So, okay. Um, ah, okay. So I, eh, we can do this now. I think it should have probably been later. I think I put it out of place. So let's just start thinking a little bit about performance. These aren't particularly good examples, but it does give you an idea of how to uh, time things. So. Remember, range 1,000 uh, indicates a range from 0 to 999. And this list comprehension, which we actually saw yesterday, is going to create what? It will create i squared for any i in L. So it'll create a list of 1,000 squares. Okay? And if we do that with the list and a list comprehension, this is the pure Python. Um, we can use this uh, percent time it magic command to see how long this uh, little snippet of code takes to execute. And what percent time it does is very useful. It actually runs it, and depending on how long it takes to run, it decides how many 
runs to do and then averages over the timing. So you get a better estimate of how long it took in case there were weird fluctuations from your computer deciding that it needed to you know, download something in the background or whatever. Um, so here you see that this took 360 microseconds, plus or minus a microsecond, per execution of that command. Um, if we do it with an array, so A range creates an array from 0 to 999, but it's an array type instead of a list type. Let's see how long it takes. I actually don't know. 1.2 microseconds, plus or minus 5.6 nanoseconds uh, per squaring every number in that, in that array, OK? So this is one of the reasons that you use arrays if you're doing numerical work, is that uh, this, for an array, this is calculating the exact same quantities, but it is doing it highly optimized internally, okay? A squared. Um, whereas if I do it in sort of the pure Pythonic list way, uh, it's, this is 300 times slower, okay? That adds up. So that's why, that's one of the reasons we use NumPy arrays to do numerical work. Okay. Yeah? Ah, a percent sign before the command? Right. So uh, this is, um, so these are called magic commands because they're so magical. Um, but what they are are commands to the, um, the Jupyter system rather than commands to your Python kernel in the background. And uh, they do, like this case, what it does is it actually this is some meta code which basically sits there and tells the Python kernel in the background to run this, look at this, a thousand times, seven runs of a thousand times each in order to estimate, do this timing for us. Um, and in this example, there's no particular reason it had to be a magic command, but it's very convenient and then it has a nice output which is sort of built into the notebook system. So a bunch of profiling commands are magic commands like that. Okay. Um, and here, just so we can see what we're calculating, there is a versus a squared. Most of you will recognize that as the transpose of the square root function. God, tough audience. Fine, it's half a parabola. You guys can keep the other half. Um, all right, so let's look at some common arrays. So, a range was the thing that created an array, uh, just like the range function created a list of numbers from say zero to 1,000. A range creates uh, arrays of numbers. Um, but the three arguments to A range, uh, if you give them three, are actually just like a slice. So uh, the first one is where to start, the second one is where to finish, and the last one is the step size. So what will this give us? Two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? And this next line, this is uh, uh, actually going to do the exact same thing. Um, this is a, because you often need regularly spaced arrays of numbers and slices, there's actually a compact notation for it, which is R underscore. As you can remember, it creates a row vector with the contents of the slice. And uh, you use square brackets for that. So it's kind of like there's a, yeah? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, that's because sometimes you want to specify the step and sometimes you want to specify the number of points. So if you look right there, there's lin space, 2, 10, 5. So let's take a look. Um, <clears throat> they do have different meaning. Uh, lin space and A range do very similar things. Start, stop, step, and this behaves like a slice, so the top is not inclusive. Lin space, start, stop, number of points, 
and actually this is inclusive of the top, okay? And it's, there's two versions because this is usually more useful if you wanna think, I wanna look at a grid of numbers from here to there regularly spaced. You don't wanna think about, well, I need it to be, in, I want 100 numbers from here to there so I can make a nice smooth looking plot. And I don't wanna think, okay, what is 99 minus 37 divided by 100 to figure out what the step size is. And then if you did that, you'd get it wrong because actually it should have been divided by Is it 101 or 99? I don't know. There's some number of bins that I need to divide this thing into, and it's not the same as the number of points. They differ by one. By the time you've thought about all that, uh, the guy who knew to use linspace is already done plotting the thing, okay? So that's why there's two versions of this function, to create regularly spaced arrays of numbers. Um, <coughs> so, and, Actually, they're both so useful that there's a compact notation for both. So you can use R underscore square brackets and then a slice, two, 10 in steps of two, and that does the exact same thing as that A range did there. Um, this allows you to very compactly say, I want a row vector that has this step size. And this is really, you know, uh, tricky. If I pass as a step size, an imaginary number, then this R underscore thing will do the lin space. Okay? Now, you might think, like, these are really the technical little, but these are really useful, actually, because you often want to create regular arrays. So knowing these compact things actually is just kind of convenient, which is why I put it in. Okay? Now, what are some other ways to uh, arrays that are common? You might want an array of ones. That is a two by two array of ones. You might want an array of zeros. There's a three by one array of zeros, so that's a column vector if you want, right? Um, what do you think this one does? Does anybody think that it's going to look at you creepily? Because <laughs> that's what I hope it will do. No? No takers? The identity matrix. Ba ba. <laughs> okay? So I3 gives me the 3 by 3 identity matrix. And then what about diag? It's going to be a diagonal matrix with 1, 2, and 3 on the diagonal. Okay? And I'm giving you these. They all have more arguments, they all have more documentation, they all have variations to create other versions, like maybe you want a matrix which is basically diagonal, but it's a little bit off diagonal. It's like the not main primary, what's it called? Main diagonal? Is it the main diagonal? The sub, anyway, say you wanted it to be on the sub main diagonals. Then you can do it, but you can read the documentation to figure out how, okay? Okay, now here's, uh, a very useful one because we actually produce so much noise in physics. We need to generate random numbers all the time, right? Uh, NP random dot rand gives me a two by two matrix of uniformly distributed numbers between zero and one. Uh, there's all kinds of other random number generators. So this one, NP random dot exponential, uh, here I've given a few more options. Scale equals three, size equals three, three. What do you guys think this will do? Well, it's clearly going to generate a random matrix. The size is just that it's three by three. So it's a three by three array of random numbers. And looking at those numbers, can you guys actually do some machine learning and infer what distribution it came from? Yes. He's good. Very good. This is an, these are sampled from an exponential distribution whose mean is three, okay? Which kind of makes sense. They're kind of on the scale of three, which is where you expect the bulk of that distribution to be. Uh, but with only nine numbers sampled from the distribution, you'd probably have a hard time reconstructing the histogram. Uh, of course, it's easy to get a lot more of them just by changing that parameter. Okay, let's get a few more. There's a lot of them. Ah, cool. I wonder, do you think we can get a histogram? 
ist, oh, I didn't save them anywhere. So let's put them in something. Will this work? Ah, so what do you, th oh, that's interesting. What did it do? I had three by 300. So this just made a histogram for me of each of the rows of 300 random numbers. And it said the first row was blue, the second row was orange, and the third row was green. So you can actually kind of see the fluctuation scale between independent 300 samplings of this exponential just from that. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, good. Let's keep going. So array D types, I mentioned this already. The data types for arrays are uh, more specific than the basic number types or numeric types for uh, Python. Um, because you need to actually, you, you usually don't need to think about this unless you're doing very serious numerics, but you do, in principle, need to specify how many bytes or bits uh, each number uh, in your array is going to use. So integers, they have various names. You can call it int 16 for 16 bits or i2 for integer two bytes. Uh, unsigned ints, floats, bools. So unsigned ints are non-negative. Uh, Fixed length strings, an array can hold a set of strings. It's a rather unusual thing to want to do, but you can do it, uh, but they have to have fixed length. So all strings of length three, that would be okay. Um, <coughs> so if we look at the D types, we already saw this basically. Uh, by default, if I pass in all integers in my array constructor, I'll get an integer D type out. Um, the 64-bit integer on, on my computer is the default. Um, if I pass in something with a float, it'll end up being a floating point array. Uh, float32, this is a reference to the D type if I wanted to specify it, or D type I4, that's a shorthand notation when you're using constructors to just say I and then the number of bytes. So this is all to indicate how you control this. Um, okay. So let's uh, keep playing. Um, what is this block of code going to do? Oh, you know, this would have, uh, this works strangely now that we're doing, uh, doing it on the notebook interface. Last time I gave these lectures, I actually had it in a more interactive interface. So this is going to sort of not pop things up right away. But let's see. So the X creates uh, a regular grid from minus pi to pi of 100 points. Y1 is the sign of X. Y2 is E to the X divided by pi. So we can execute that. Then this thing is going to create a figure and plot x and y1 and x and y2 um, and labels those lines. But notice right now we don't see any labels. We just see the lines and the axes. The figure was created. Now without disconnecting it, so I'm not going to hit this blue button up here. I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to execute x label and y label. And you see here I might be able to zoom what happened? Oh. OK, we can see a little bit more. Anyway, uh, x and y appeared. Then I can go to the next one, legend. Oh, what happened there? Hey, it created a legend. And that's where it put those labels. OK? And notice they're beautiful, right? Pure golden LaTeX. OK, so, uh, and if we wanted, oh, it already put the legend in the upper left. It was pretty smart about that. But if we wanted, we could put it in the lower right. And now we go back and look, it's moved. It removed it from that corner and put it down there. Okay. Um, OK, so this GCF. We don't need to do it because we're using the notebook backend. This gets the current figure. And we'll basically make another copy of it in my notebook. But it already created it here, so I didn't really need it. But that's, that's what GCF does. Sorry, what? Can you what? You can put it wherever you want. The easiest places to put it are the ones like lower left, upper right. But you can even specify more precisely where you want it. You just have to read the documentation about how to do it. Okay? 
And how do we find documentation while we're doing things interactively? Shift tab. OK, good. GCF killed your figure? Well, that was mean. Oh, it didn't put another one in there? Oh, well, that's sad. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, the interaction between the back end on this server and the notebooks is a little bit flaky, I think. OK, then it's because of how you have it set up. I, I, I won't take any responsibility. But I'll help you fix it after class if you really want to. Um, OK, what about some 2D visualization? So <coughs> what do you guys think this will do? Line one. We already saw this command. That creates a 30 by 30 array of random numbers uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. And it assigns it to a variable we called img for image, Im image. Then we create a figure. And then we do im show for image show and uh, image. And then I set a color map, which basically tells it what color scheme to map these numbers between 0 and 1 uh, into colors with. That's called a color map. And then I turn on a color bar, which tells us how to read those colors. So there it is a random map of hotness, okay? And with a color bar over here indicating what dark to light means, okay? 2D visualization in a couple lines. Good, I'm gonna disconnect that. And then, um, so this, <coughs> <coughs> this command isn't strictly necessary here, but I wanna tell you what it's doing, close all is actually closing all the figures that you've been creating in the system out of memory. And if you create lots of figures, you normally don't need to do it, but if you create lots of figures like 20 or 30, it'll start complaining and it might slow things down. So this is just a good way to close them all. Um, they're still in my notebook. That didn't remove them. It just removed the interactive part of the figure from memory so that it wasn't tying up the kernel anymore. So that's a useful command. Okay, now slicing. Uh, one of the most important features of arrays is their sophisticated slicing ability. Um, we've already seen um, uh, slicing a little bit. So let's create an array, uh, a range 0 to 10, so it goes 0 to 9. And we know what a slice is. It goes from start to stop. Um, so this is a basic one. It went from the third to the second to last, right, from 3 third to minus two, not including the minus two. And so we got three to seven. This next one takes every other uh, entry from third to eighth. <coughs> the um, empty slice actually just returns what it gave. It goes implicitly from start to end. Um, but then, of course, we can actually use a negative step, and so that empty slice uh, just goes backwards now. So that was a quick way to reverse the array, okay? Um, now, an important thing about slices of arrays, these things are views into the data. They're not copies. So if you change, the, if you slice and then assigned to the slice, you will change those sub-pieces of the array. That's part of what makes them so useful. You'll just do it in place in memory, okay? So we'll start playing with that a little bit more uh, here. Let's do a 2D example. So here I've, well, what did I do? I have an array, a range 20, so I created the numbers from zero to 19 as a 1D array, then I reshaped it into a four by five array, which was okay because four times five is 20. So that's okay, I didn't change the total number. Um, and that created this nice 2D array that's uh, four rows by five columns of the numbers from zero to 19. So let's just work through these slices. Uh, well, this should give me the last two columns. 
Did it? Right? Then here we're just using the fact that if you don't put a number in, it'll default to the beginning or end, depending what position it is. So A colon 4 from 3 to 5, A colon, 3 colon, all of these do the same thing. But now it can get kind of more interesting. We can take every other row by using a colon colon 2 slice in the row position and only the first three columns. There it is, 0, 1, 2, 10, 11, 12. Let's go back and look. Uh, that is the first three columns of the first row and the first three columns of the, well, third row, right? Zeroth and second row in zero indexed language. Here, we can get the whole matrix and just reverse the rows. Well, here, this minus one is in the step position. I have two colons. Then it wouldn't put anything out. So yeah, it just sort of decides that if you're doing a, a reversed, then the start and stop essentially are reversed as well. So this is implicitly from the end to the beginning. Otherwise, it wouldn't, wouldn't make a lot of sense to have this notation. So, yeah, that's right, though. It does. Um, and actually, if I don't, if, if I have this get everything for the, say, column index, I don't even need to write it. I can just reverse the rows, right? Um, but like I said, I can, <coughs> excuse me, slices are views into the data. So I can change an entire slice or subgrid or whatever I can construct by this kind of notation, uh, I can change in place. So, uh, if I look at this uh, command, what I'm doing is I'm taking every other column, uh, sorry, every other row, first three columns, so it's the same slice I had up here, and I'm going to multiply them in place. Star equals means multiply by uh, 20. And there it is. I've now... A now contains an array where the first three entries of the first row and the first three entries of the third row have been scaled up by 20. Okay. And this uh, command here, well, I'm taking the first row, zero indexed, uh, all columns, and setting it equal to zero. And there it is. I zeroed out that row. Okay. These are slicing tricks, and also very useful to get to know how to slice, because if you can do things with a slice notation, write a compact line that just sort of does the right stuff in the right places, your code in Python will one, be compact, and two, be uh, pretty much as fast as anything you could do in a compiled language, because it will optimize the way it implements that uh, internally. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, so there's actually a little bit more fancy indexing you can do, but if it's not, this is even fancier than slicing. Um, if you do this to pull out subarrays which aren't as regular as you can specify by slicing, then it does create a copy. So you can't actually assign to things like this. Um, <clears throat> so here I'm going to create an array, which is three by three of the numbers from zero to nine or zero to eight. Um, <coughs> what this is doing, because I've got now a tuple inside the square brackets, I'm actually handing, handing it a uh, give me the 0, 1, and then the 1, 2 um, entry. Uh, and so those are the 0, 1, and 1, 2 entries, 1 and 5. The other thing I can do, which actually is often more useful than this version of fancy indexing, um, is I can create a mask. So a mask would be an array, which is the same shape uh, as another array, but it's just an array of trues and false, right? And then I can use the mask to only do operations on things where it's true. That's the idea of using a mask. So here, oops, this mask, uh, is a three by three array, 
which is true when a percent two equals equals zero. So sorry, I didn't explain this notation yesterday. Percent means divide this by that and give me the integer remainder. So a mod two. And so this is basically equals equals is testing whether that's equal to zero. It returns true or false. And so each entry in this array, this is a three by three array, is true or false depending on if the corresponding number in A is even or odd. Right? True, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, true. D type is bool. <coughs> and we can take a look actually at that mask with this kind of neat uh, plotting function called spy, which is uh, for spying on a matrix. It just tells you where it's non zero, basically. Um, and so we can see. Uh, well, true, false, true, true, false, true, false, et cetera. So we spied on the mask. Um, that's just a picture. And now if I uh, use the mask as the thing I'm going to index with, my array, I get out the even integers, the places where it was true. Okay. Now, uh, this I, I wrote here flattens means that it gives me just the set of them. They're not in a rectangular form anymore in a general mask. Here they were in like a checkerboard. And there's no way for the array to represent the checkerboard shape. And so it just returns them in order, sort of reading left to right, top to bottom uh, in your mask. Okay, So this is called flattening the array. Um, and this is also not, like I said, this is not a view into the array. You can't change these numbers and they'll change in the original array. It's a copy. Okay. All right, any, um, okay, we're doing good. Any questions so far? There have been a few already. Okay, let's, let's start moving towards a slightly more physics-y topic, sparse matrices. Um, pretty much all of the matrices, except in random matrix theory and in certain SICK models, all the matrices you're gonna bump into in physics are sparse. Okay, and uh, so in quantum physics, they, they are typically sparse because they correspond to local Hamiltonians. Okay, which, what is a sparse matrix? Yeah, a sparse matrix is just a matrix where most of the elements are zero, right? And you can sort of try to be quantitative, oh, there's less than a tenth of the elements are non-zero, who cares? If most of the elements are zero, it's sparse, all right? And let's take a look. So let's define the Pauli matrices. There they are. So uh, actually, we can take a look at some of them. Just let me remind you, id is the identity, not my ego. Sx is the Pauli X operator, SZ, the Pauli Z operator, and SY is what? It's the only one I didn't explicitly write here. I happen to know the algebra of the Pauli operators allows me to write SY as minus I times uh, SZ times SX. So what is this? So it's off diagonal and there's some i's in it. And is the minus one on the top or the bottom? Pali SY. It's on the top. Um, that's on the test at the end of this summer school. Okay? You gotta know the Pali matrices. Shouldn't have to look them up, shouldn't have to think about it. Minus i, right there. Okay, I know where you are. All right, so now suppose that I have a two-spin system, uh, and the Hamiltonian, I feel like I have to write something analytic in this whole thing, right? So the Hamiltonian is Sx, well, I'll put the x up, on spin one. So here's my spin, and here's spins one and two, right? So, of course, that's a little bit trivial. There's nothing acting on two. Uh, what do we mean by that as matrices, implicitly? There's a hidden tensor product, right? 
If you, actually it's kind of amazing. So how many people know that what this means is that there's a, if you want to represent it in matrices, there's a tensor identity uh, here. So that's the Pauli SX and the tensor identity on the second position. Okay, raise your, uh, raise your hands if that was like really new. Okay, so a few people aren't familiar with that. Uh, if you go to a math, like go talk to mathematicians, and you say that's what I mean by S1X, you'd be shocked <laughs> how painful it is <laughs> to convince them that that's what you mean and that it makes sense, okay? But anyway, this is what we mean by SX acting on here. It means that that operator uh, is on this tensor factor of the Hilbert space but not on this one, and that implicitly means that there's an identity acting on the other one, okay? So that uh, 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 tensor, the identity, can be represented in matrices in terms of what's called a Kronecker product. That's what it is. So here is Kron SX id. So how big should this matrix be? Four by four. And what it, <coughs> what it looks like is that. And uh, what that is, if it's not clear, um, is that I took uh, the SX, which was a 1, 1, 0, 0, and then I tensored the identity, which means I turn each of these into a block, which is 1 times uh, the identity, 1 times the identity matrix, 2 by 2 identity matrix, 0 times the identity matrix, 0 times the identity matrix. Uh, and of course, that's what is up there. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, sorry, this is probably too small anyway, but you guys can hopefully see it in your Python notebooks. Okay, how many non-zero matrix elements are there? Four. How many matrix elements are there? 16. Four is a lot less than 16. It's a sparse matrix, okay? So, Anyway, we can have Python help us visualize that. We can spy on the matrix. Pretty, right? That's all the, oh, sorry. Ah, what did I do? Look at my code. What did I do? I shocked myself. This matrix is too big. I put another spin in there. Look, I croned a cron. Cron SX id, cron id, right? Uh, the Kronecker product is associative, so it doesn't actually matter exactly where I put the parentheses and all those crons, but the Kronecker product of SX identity identity is what it would be if I had a third spin. Here he is, three, and that means I need another tensor identity, and that means this will become an eight by eight matrix, but it's still very sparse, okay? And this is where the ones are from our figure. All right. So uh, it's clearly inefficient if you're working with really big matrices like come up with spin systems when n gets larger than three. Uh, how big are they for general n for spin half? Two to the n by two to the n, which is a lot of matrix elements when n gets bigger than, mm, I don't know, four or five. It's already more than I want to write down usually. Um, and if they're mostly sparse, like came up in that example, where there's actually only one non-zero entry on each row, then you're wasting both a lot of space and a lot of time by doing matrix manipulations with the full dense set of numbers, most of which are zero. If you multiply two matrices, you have row times column, and most things are zero, they just give you zero contributions anyway. So why have the computer go to the trouble of doing that? So, uh, what you want to use are sparse representations of that matrix, okay? So SciPy provides sparse matrix libraries, okay? You don't need, as we'll see in a minute, to understand all the possible ways that SciPy can represent a sparse matrix for you. It's helpful to have a basic idea of how they work, but it'll do all the heavy lifting. All the bookkeeping is really what it's doing, right? So uh, to import the sparse uh, matrix libraries. We import scipy.sparse sparse as SPS. Uh, that's just to make it shorter for us to write, SPS dot stuff. Um, 
And there are a bunch of different <coughs> sparse matrix formats that SciPy supports. Um, they have a bunch of names. Compressed sparse row, compressed, compressed sparse column, diagonal, coordinate, dictionary of keys, list, linked lists, uh, and block sparse row, okay? These essentially are all different ways of just doing the bookkeeping of where are the non-zero entries and what are they, right? So uh, a simplest one, a simple one to understand is coordinate. I store a big list of I, J, so for each non-zero entry, I store in a list I, J, and the value of that entry. Okay. That's not a very efficient representation to do computations with, but it's a, it's a simple representation to understand. It's a simple representation to construct. Okay. Uh, the dictionary of keys is a Pythonic way to do the coordinate representation using a dictionary where the keys are I, J, and the values are the value. So those are essentially the same, but internally they're stored a bit differently. Um, the actual faster representations for doing math with are the first three. Compressed sparse row, CSR, compressed sparse column, CSC, and diagonal. So diagonal obviously is only really good if you have a matrix which is essentially only non-zero near the diagonal, okay? Which comes up a surprisingly large amount. So the main diagonal and maybe some other diagonals are non-zero uh, and everything else is zero, okay? then the diagonal representation just stores a list of all the values on each of the diagonals, which is non-zero, right? The compressed sparse row and column representations uh, are a bit more complicated to explain how they store it. They basically tell you, uh, they store in order, reading, say, for compressed sparse row, in order, uh, reading from the top left of a matrix, like you would normally read, uh, just what the non-zero entries are, so that's in a big vector. And then uh, in another vector, it stores what column they are in. And in a final vector, it just stores a short list of at which positions the row number changes. So it's sort of like the first row's things are here, then the second row's things, and the third row's things, and so on. Um, this is not a very easy representation to work with if you are doing the coding under the hood, but it's a very fast representation once you've got it set up, uh, to do matrix multiplies or matrix vector multiplies because you have row information stored contiguously like this and you want to multiply by a column vector. So that's the representation that you'll typically want to use uh, when you actually start doing uh, sparse linear algebra. But one beautiful thing about Python is that you can construct in coordinate or dictionary of keys or whatever is the simplest way for you to construct your sparse matrix or you can use, as you'll see, Kronecker products with sparse matrices like we're about to do and you will get a beautiful sparse matrix and Python can then convert it to CSR for you. You don't have to do any work and then you can use that CSR representation to do your, your math. But you do have to know a little bit which kinds of operations are fast with which kinds of matrices, okay, Re representations. Okay, that's enough. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So now we're going to create, uh, again, just two by two Pali matrices, identity, SX, SZ, and SY, but we're doing it <coughs> with this sparse.i, sparse.csr matrix of the SX matrix and the uh, uh, SZ matrix and their product. Um, so all I did was use uh, this um, uh, SPS or sparse library version of the identity constructor. Here I created a normal array because this was such a small one anyway. Sometimes you don't want to do that, but in this case it's not a big deal. Um, and then converted it to CSR using this uh, constructor. Okay? So if I try to look at the identity matrix, what am I going to see? what I'm talking about, <laughs> nobody knows my sorry. Uh, so I'm not gonna see the identity. I'm actually just gonna see this little stub, which is telling me it's a two by two sparse matrix of, of type float with two non-zero entries, two stored elements, 
uh, in this case in diagonal format. Um, I can see the actual sort of dense array by calling to array, and this returned, returned it to the normal array type, okay? You don't want to do that with a really big array because it'll create a lot of zeros. It'll take a lot of memory if the array is really big. But it's nice for these small ones. Uh, here's another warning. There is another method called to dense. These are called dense arrays as opposed to sparse arrays. Uh, and that returns the matrix type instead of the array type. And it is only there for historical reasons. And like I said, don't use the matrix type. So don't use to dense. It will literally only introduce bugs and make you cry. Okay, and I know, I've cried over them. <laughs> yeah? Okay, good. Uh, SX, this thing, it's smart enough, even though I handed a dense array of floats, it was smart enough to realize that two of the zeros shouldn't be stored, and so it uh, stored this in CSR format, compressed sparse row format. Uh, SZ, um, similarly. SY, uh, there it is, another uh, CSR. All of them actually only have two non-zero entries. We can look at it, and indeed, the minus i has stayed on top as it should. Okay, so now let's start uh, doing some physics. Let's consider um, a three-site transverse field Ising model, Ising chain, with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, the operators, as I mentioned over here, the operators sigma i, or si, um, are implicitly tensor products with the identities on the other side. So sigma zi, uh, say sigma z1, is got an identity on the left and an identity on the right because there's an identity on the zero spin and an identity on the two spin for a length three chain, okay? Um, and uh, if it's, I hope it's reasonably familiar, but this is just, you know, a chain of three spins which are coupled by a ferromagnetic ZZ interaction, well, if J is positive, it's ferromagnetic. It wants to make the spins point in the same direction. And then this is a transverse field, so a field pointing in the X direction transverse to the coupling, okay? Um, so how do we deal with this? So <coughs> SX acting on spin zero in a two-site chain would be this Kronecker product, SX id. And notice, I used sparse cron because I was passing it to sparse matrices and I wanted to get out a sparse matrix. And it has actually given me a four by four sparse matrix of floats with only eight stored elements, which is exactly what I was hoping for. Okay. <clears throat> uh, if I look at it, it is the uh, matrix that we met not long ago. Now, zero in three, which we also did densely just a few minutes ago, so this is SX acting on the zeroth spin out of a three-site chain, I need to Kronecker product an additional identity onto it. There it is. But at the intermediate step, I mean, I put that two array there, two array there so we could see uh, this sigma X tensor identity twice, um, but it, it is actually stored sparsely. Um, You can imagine that uh, if you have like n as a parameter, the length of your chain, you need to keep tensoring on these identities. You don't want to have to do that sort of by hand, by writing cron, 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 cron. It's kind of the thing that computers are good at, doing the same thing over and over again, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out a way to construct sort of the general case of an operator, which is a Kronecker product. Okay, so here's one way to do it. That's pretty clear, I think. So we're gonna create a list. This is a Pythonic list of three operators that are two by two. SX, identity, identity. Those are all sparse matrices, but that's fine. There's my list. It's a list of three sparse two by two matrices, right? Then, <clears throat> here, what I'm gonna do is first, this is slightly tricky, First, I set SX0 to be the first element of that list. Okay, so it's gonna be set to SX. Then, for op in op list from one to the end, so from the second element to the end, uh, 
Kronecker product onto SX0, that operator, and then assign it back to SX0. So what does this do? That created what I wanted to create. And how did it work? Well, uh, essentially, I just used this iteration over the identities here. Uh, and on each pass through the iteration, I chronicle producted the next thing onto the previous iteration, uh, output of the previous iteration, SX not, and then I assigned it to SX not, which is why it sort of grew on each step, right? So this was, <coughs> now I could easily change this to act on, say, a foresight chain. I just make this list one site longer, and the same code now created a really big array, okay? Now, uh, for those of you who like functional programming techniques, here's a more compact way to write the same thing. If you don't know what uh, reduce means, then I'm not gonna explain it right now. But the people who know what uh, reduction by a function is will understand this line. I'm just telling you, you can do it, okay? You can ask me after if you really wanna know. I don't wanna explain it right now. Um, okay, this effectively does the exact same thing that our for loop did. Um, and Indeed, we got the exact same output. Now, let me go back to the case uh, where this was only three, like that, and I'll run that, and I will check. Indeed, I have an eight by eight array. Good. So, <coughs> this code, which I've written here for you, uh, is still maybe not the most uh, convenient. I should wrap it up in a function to do this uh, do this, but actually I wanted to leave that as an exercise for you guys. Um, so what this does is it's creating a uh, Hamiltonian, which is SX acting on the zeroth site. This reduce SPS cron of this list was the thing that put it SX tensor identity tensor identity, plus, same thing, identity tensor SX tensor identity, plus, same thing, identity identity SX, okay? Uh, and the bond terms are quite similar. They are SZ tensor SZ tensor identity. So there's an SZ on zero, an SZ on one, and an identity on two for the first term. Then there is a identity SZ SZ, and an SZ identity SZ, this is the periodic term on our little periodic chain, okay? And so this uh, line also illustrates that here I'm adding, and it's kind of too long for it all to go on one line, so if I want to have a multi-line uh, command in Python, I can put a backslash in the end and then keep going. So I'm going to execute that. And now I have these two uh, 8 by 8 uh, matrices. So we can take a look. Um, H field uh, is 8 by 8. It has some number of non zero elements, and we can look at it. And there it is, it's got ones in some funny locations that would have been hard to sort out by hand, but the computer did it for you. Um, and now let's actually construct a Hamiltonian. I've here set J equal to one and the transverse field equal to a half in units of J. That line probably looks kinda like what we would have written mathematically. H bond is that sum of those bond terms and H field was that sum of the field terms. And we can just check by spying that that final Hamiltonian, which had both terms in it, actually has this sparsity structure, right? So it's still very sparse, which is why it's useful to use sparse techniques, okay? <coughs> now, having constructed it dense, I just wanted to show you how to diagonalize. So now I'm creating a dense version of the Hamiltonian, and I'm calling, uh, the numpy.linalg, this is a numpy linear algebra package, eigh subroutine, which is the Hermitian eigen solver. I give it the Hamiltonian, and it returns for me uh, two things, E and U. E is the energies. How many should there be? Eight. 
It's an eight by eight matrix. I just diagonalized it, so there should be eight eigenvalues. Those are the energies, and there they are. And uh, U is the unitary which diagonalizes it. Or alternatively, the columns of U are the eigenvectors, the eigenstates of H. Okay? Which means, in particular, that if I take the Hamiltonian and I multiply, say, the first column, uh, I should get the energy of that eigenstate times the first column back, right? So what will this line give me? Okay, What's the, what, what will I get? So I'll just get the eigenvalue? Let's, let's see. So what was that? So the ham dense at u colon 1 pulled out the first eigenvector, because they're column vectors of u. Uh, I acted on it because it was an eigenvector. It should have been minus 3.14575131 times the column vector, right? But then I divided, and of course, division is element-wise. So I divided that by the eigenvector itself, so I get a vector of uh, eight entries, each of which is the eigenvalue. <clears throat> now we can plot the spectrum. For a little size three chain. On the x-axis, I've put the field. Of course, we've only evaluated this at one field value. H is a half. On the y-axis, I've put the energy. And you know, I put a little x at each of the eight uh, energy locations. And does anybody know what, you know, how to physically interpret this weird looking data? There's two states that are very close together near the bottom, then there's a bit of a gap, and then there's a bunch of states up here. What's that? Yeah, so we are in the ferromagnetic phase of this little Ising chain, and there is an almost degenerate pair of states that roughly correspond to magnetization up and magnetization down. And then there's a gap to the excitations, which are domain wall-like excitations of that chain. And they cost finite energy to create, and so there's a gap. Okay. So magically, physics came out of some sparse matrices. Um, <coughs> ah, it's not a numerical error. Numerical error for these small matrices is completely to forget about. That's because it's only a finite length chain. The degeneracy is split exponentially in the length of the chain. So it's e to the minus l over the correlation length, which is something, and that's just not zero when l is only three. Okay. Um, good. So that's, that's a finite size effect that they're not exactly degenerate, though a very small one. OK, so we did that using a, a full solver, because an 8 by 8 matrix is actually really small, so we might as well do it dense. Um, we created them sparse, and if we went to bigger systems, we would need to use sparse diagonalization techniques. Uh, I'm not going to explain how they work. I don't know if somebody else at this school is actually going to talk about. Okay. So you guys, if you don't know what a Krylov technique is or Langshaus, you won't learn here, but you will learn how to use it. Okay. Um, and you can read about it. So uh, given a sparse representation of a matrix, there are iterative techniques which don't require working on the entire Hamiltonian uh, to get the eigenspectrum or parts of it. Um, they are wrapped up in, in SciPy, uh, sparse.linalge. So I've imported that as SPSLin. They work just like the non-sparse solver. They just have a different name, SPSLin.igsh. That S is for the sparse. There's my sparse Hamiltonian, ham. K equals four tells the solver I only want the, the I only want four states. So sparse techniques won't give you the entire spectrum. They'll only give you some number that you request. And uh, the more you request, the longer it will take. 
Um, and then the which here is telling the solver, I want the smallest algebraic ones. That basically means the bottom of the spectrum. Because you could also ask for the largest ones or the ones nearest zero or whatever. So you can read the documentation for exactly how that works. And this will return the bottom for energies. Let's see, do they match? 3.232 and my uh, 3.232. 3.145. 3.145, et cetera, okay? So we got the bottom four from this. That was actually a wrapper for a numerical package called LAPAC and RPAC. These are pretty heavy duty, well-optimized mature systems, so they'll work for most purposes, though there are fancier ones available if you want to parallelize and so on. So we got the energies. Ah, look, I even put it there. We can compare right next to each other. These agree to as many digits as it is displayed uh, between the dense diagonalization we did a minute ago and the sparse one that we did into E2. Now, what's faster? What do you guys think? We can put them head to head with this time it thing. Okay, so the dense thing took 19 microseconds to diagonalize an eight by eight matrix. And do you guys think the sparse one's gonna beat it? Who thinks the sparse is gonna win? Who thinks the dense is gonna win? All right, is anybody taking money? No? no. Boom! Look at that, that horrible, that's terrible. That's like a factor of 20 slower. So the sparse iterative technique, uh, the technical term is sucks if you're trying to get the spectrum of a very small matrix. Don't waste your time, just do it dense. But there's gonna be some point when the matrix is big enough and sparse enough where the sparse technique will be faster. And there'll be some point where you can't even do the dense technique because the matrix is just too big to hold in memory. Okay? Um, <coughs> uh, and also, you can gain a little bit. There's a version of both the sparse and the non-sparse eigensolvers which doesn't return the eigenvectors to you. And if you don't need the eigenvectors, then don't ask for them because you save a little bit of time by not constructing them. So um, this eigvals h as opposed to eig h gives us just the energies. And they are the correct energies. And if we compare um, the timing, uh, so for a slightly different uh, notation for the dense one, you call eigenvals h. For the sparse one, you tell it don't return the eigenvectors. All of this is in the documentation, shift tab. And if we compare 13 microseconds to, sorry, it's scrolled off, 19, uh, we actually gained a fair bit. I mean, not that six microseconds matters that much to most people, but in this case. Anyway, so that's non trivial because we didn't bother to return the eigenvectors. And the sparse one was not, saved 20 microseconds out of about essentially 400. So it's not a big savings, but if you don't need it, don't construct it. And also it takes less memory, a little bit. Okay, so um, now this code is going to diagonalize in steps at all these h values from zero to four in steps of 0 0.1. Uh, it's gonna diagonalize, construct that Hamiltonian and diagonalize it. Um, and store the energies in an array that I've prepared in advance for the purpose. And then we'll do that. Uh, that was fast. And then we'll plot it. And there is the spectrum of this three site transverse field Ising chain as a function of field. Uh, that's energy and field. And uh, where's the phase transition? What's that? So we can see it, kinda. Over here, at small transverse field, the system, the ferromagnetic term is dominant, and we see that there's a, a very good degeneracy between the bottom two states, which were those all up and all down states, roughly. And when we go to very big transverse field, the transverse term is dominant, which means that the ground state basically, instead of wanting to look either up or down, wants to look left. Right? And uh, 
uh, that's a unique state, and then there's a gap above it. So this is the paramagnetic side, and that's the ferromagnetic side. And the, trans the actual transition in the transverse field Ising model by exact solution at whatever infinite thermodynamic limit is at 1. J equals H equals 1. Uh, and what you're seeing, this little splitting here that happens a bit early, is a finite size rounding of the transition. In principle, the gap here should also close. And you can't see that at all in the uh, finite size three numerics, okay? Because it's too small to see the gap to the quasi-particle excitations close. But if you go to bigger systems, you might be able to see it. Um, now, I didn't explain this code in detail, but I'll let you read through it. I think we've covered almost everything in it. And in the last half hour, or however long you want to sit here, um, I've written here a whole bunch of tasks for you guys to do, okay? And this is like the interactive wake up, do stuff part of the, you know, of the, of the lecture, right? Uh, so generalize the code to n sites and make a similar plot for n is 4, 6, 8, and 10. And my hint, and this is why I didn't do it for you actually, is to write a function, make sxin, which returns the uh, sx operator acting on site i in an n site Hilbert space. So the right identities, chronic or producted onto it. And similarly, a make SZ, SZ term, I and J, so acting on I and J. In this code, you'll usually want it to be I and I plus one, but it's periodic, so you might want it to be N minus one and zero. Um, and once you have those functions, it should be very easy to generalize the code. Um, and then you can think about how much uh, space these require and at what size, if you can do all this, you can actually see, just test it. What size does the diagonalization become faster by the sparse techniques than the dense ones, once you can construct it all? But really, the physics thing is to go to larger sizes, once you have the code to make this general, and replot this and see how it looks as you make the size bigger, and see if you can see the phase transition sharpen into a phase transition. Okay, go. First person to Measure the scaling exponents of the transition uh, gets a beer. <laughs> I'm here. You can ask questions. I'll wander around. I'm sure there's also some other Pythonistas in the room who can help. What's that? Oh. Yeah. Oh, well, that makes it hard. So the Jupyter server is not working? No. Ha. Huh. How many people have a local copy running? I'm trying to. There's a few people? Uh, OK. Well, you can all like, crowd around that. I'm sorry, I think we, we need to upgrade the server somehow. Uh, it seems like 100 people connecting to it blows it up. Um, huh? There are, there are some publicly available servers, and you could copy and paste some of the code into that if you want to play with it. Um, they're test servers. Let's see. Jupyter. Oops, wrong website. Jupyter. You also can, it's not that hard to install Jupyter on your system with Anaconda uh, if you want to. And maybe I should encourage more people to try or get your friends to help you do it if you're not confident about how to do that um, so that more people can do it locally on their machines uh, for tomorrow. Environments. Use, use Anaconda, just do the default stack. Yeah, 
Uh, unless you have a reason not to do that. I mean, all the things say, oh, do it fancy ways, but if it works, it works. <coughs> yeah. It is a mess. So actually, this is a good point. The hardest part about using Python is actually just getting the, the full stack installed properly on your computer. And it's really unclear. It's much easier now than it was a few years ago, but it's still a pain. The easiest way to do it is with Anaconda and follow some directions online, like step by step, for which pieces to install. Anaconda should just do it for you. Um, I typically install it using pip and a, a more manual installation, but it's because I know exactly what I want. Um, there are some people around the room who clearly know how to do this, and they might be able to help. I can help if somebody gets wedged. Uh, Does it kill rabbits? Most anacondas do eat rabbits, yes. Your what -um? <coughs> They kill what? <laughs> I use this, and if I download anaconda, is it oh, like Adam. this? No. Shouldn't. So I can use both never simultaneously. <laughs> In principle, I, yes. I heard some rumors that it happens. It, oh, it clobbers it? Yes. That's happened to me a couple of times. It clobbered Adam? Because you, you tend to get multiple references to different Pythons. That's the problem. Yeah. Let me 